When that malware hit our networks, it's what started uh, U.S. Cyber Command, because the Secretary of Defense realized that we need to bring our defense together with other capabilities in the nation. Do that at NSA, leverage that platform. Uh, NSA was one of the initial ones that found the problem, came up with a solution for it, and when we looked at that, that's what we need in our nation, and that's what the military needs. We have moved quickly in putting together Cyber Command. May 2010, we had our initial operating capability. October 2010, full operational capability for the staff. We have stood up the four components under that, and we are growing capacity. That will take some time to build that capacity, but every day is an improvement. We are building plans with the other combatant commands to help in cyberspace, and we are defending and operating the military networks today, a huge step forward. And we are doing that by bringing the full capability of the Defense Department and Intel community together under one roof. I can't tell you how important that is. It's huge in our capabilities. So when you look at that, the Defense Department has a tremendous jump forward in what we're doing and how we're doing it. And the ability and agility to move quickly between operations and defense, when events like what's happened in Japan to our networks, we can quickly accommodate, whether it's a, a natural disaster or a man-made disaster. I think that's a huge step forward. Um, so, I want to leave time for questions, and I know we've been we've, we've asked to go quickly, but there are a few things I'd like to hit that Secretary Lin hit in the article that you referenced. He he mentioned five key areas about cyberspace uh, uh, is a, a domain analogous to air, land, sea, and space. Um, he talked about the active defense. He talked about critical infrastructure. He talked about partnering with our allies, and he talked about leveraging technology. Two of those are key, oh, they're all key, of course, uh, but two of those are key for this discussion, and that is how are we going to defend. And the active defense is what we did in leveraging what NSA can do with what the Defense Department is doing. And from my perspective, that's key. How are we going to hunt in our networks? How do we provide an, a, a capability that goes beyond what you can commercially buy, buy by leveraging our intelligence community and our military capabilities to help expand our defense? How do you leverage that global cryptologic platform as an early warning capability? It's those kinds of things that we have to look at. And finally, when we prove that that's good for the military networks, I think he made a great point that resonates with what you said. How do we then extend that lawfully while protecting civil liberties and cyber and security to the rest of government and critical infrastructure? And of course, doing that right, that's what's taking time. That's what everyone is working on. I think that's a huge step forward. Uh, I would tell you that one of the things that, from my perspective, is so important in this area, you know, our nation built the Internet. We are the ones that developed this, the iPad and many of the devices that we have. We are an innovation nation. We are the ones that came up with that. It seems to me we are the ones that ought to solve this security problem, and we can. And it is going to take a partnership between us and industry. It is something that we ought to work together, and we can do this. We just need to drive through it. Mr. Chairman, that's all I have. Thank you. Um, I, I, I appreciate your comments. Let me yield to uh, the ranking member for any comments he'd like to make, and if he wants to go ahead and do his questions right after that, I yield to him. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, for uh, for calling this uh, very important uh, subcommittee hearing, I want to thank uh, Dr. Miller and General Alexander for uh, for being here today. I want to uh, welcome you and. Uh, uh, in particular, General, I want to just uh, take a moment to commend you on uh, the successful stand-up uh, of your new command uh, over the past months, and I want to thank you both uh, for appearing today to discuss what I believe is one of the most important uh, missions uh, and national security uh, issues facing our nation today. Uh, it is difficult to fully appreciate the importance of cybersecurity issues uh, in, to our national security. Uh, from day-to-day -day tasks to critical operations, our warfighters depend on the integrity uh, of uh, our networks. At the same time, cyberspace itself has become weaponized. Uh, the Stuxnet virus, as well as massive denial of service attacks uh, successfully targeting our allies in Georgia and Estonia, uh, have given us a glimpse of the damage cyber weapons can cause. In some ways, thinking about uh, conflict in cyberspace reminds us of some uh, war fighting 
basics. The principles of offense and defense appear to remain largely the same, but the speed of information is so fast that complexity increases exponentially. Also, unlike the land, sea, or air, uh, this uh, virtual uh, man-made domain is limitless. I believe that we must better understand how the United States should safeguard our critical networks, while at the same time developing the full spectrum uh, of cyber tools to deal with conflict uh, in a new environment. General Alexander, last September, when you appeared before the Armed Services Committee, I asked you about your role in defending critical infrastructure from cyber attack that may reside in other parts of the government or in private hands. You noted that your role as head of U.S. Cybercom was to protect only military networks, at a, uh, at an, uh, and that's within your authority. Uh, and that's uh, it. Really, uh, for the most part, uh, is limited there. At uh, an emerging uh, threat subcommittee hearing later that day, with the chiefs of our of the of our services. Uh, cyber components, I revisited your answer and asked what they were doing to protect military bases that solely rely on civilian critical infrastructure. Their answers, unfortunately, were grim but not unexpected. Uh, for example, Vice Admiral Barry McCullough, head of the Navy's 10th Fleet, testified that, and I quote, these systems are very vulnerable to attack, end quote, noting that much of the power and water systems for our military bases are served by single sources that have only very limited backup capabilities. With an attack like uh, the one demonstrated by Idaho National Labs in their Aurora experiment on a power station potentially requiring weeks or even months to recover from, uh, our bases could face serious problems maintaining operational status. Beyond even the, the massive damage to our economy and civilian institutions that a major attack on our critical infrastructure could have, clearly this is a vital military concern as well. Today, uh, I introduced uh, language uh, which uh, the House authorization uh, the bill passed in our National Defense Authorization uh, Act last year, which would enable the White House to better coordinate our federal cyber defenses and secure our critical infrastructure. I believe it is essential that we continue to make progress in managing this threat. Although we, we have not yet faced a catastrophic cyber attack, and that is very fortunate, uh, but I do recognize that every day we see uh, lower level intrusions and, and thefts uh, of everything from sensitive defense information to information on our financial uh, system and critical infrastructure, as suggested in numerous press reports. While I am certainly thankful that we have so far been spared a major attack, the low level of these incidents uh, has come and uh, has in some ways hindered our ability to move forward on solving this issue. As the Commander of Cybercom and the Director of the National Security Agency, General, you direct our nation's most powerful capabilities in the cyber realm, and I know that. Uh, uh, from speaking with you, that, you're also, that you also share uh, my concerns that we have not yet fully seen the extent of the damage that cyber weapons can wreak. I know that defending against the collapse of our financial system or a meltdown of our power grid is outside the scope of the Department of Defense's responsibilities in, 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 uh, in many ways, but um, uh, if done intentionally, it would still amount to an act of war. Today, I look forward to discussing and hearing further about uh, how Cyber Command is growing and how your component commands are coming online. I also look forward to hearing how the administration is developing an overarching approach to cybersecurity and how DOD's role may need to evolve. Most of all, I hope to understand what the administration plans to do to fill the gap between these growing threats and our ability in the public and private sectors to manage them. What authorities should we examine and what tools can the government develop to increase our ability on a national level to meet these challenges. Again, I want to thank you both for being here today. Uh, I appreciate your testimony, and uh, I look forward to our, our question and answer period. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, with that, uh, I will yield back to you unless uh, you want me to go into it. Uh, I questions. think uh, if the gentleman wants to proceed with his questions, we will operate under the five-minute rule. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, General, if I could, uh, perhaps I would begin with you. Uh, it is clear that if enemy bombers were heading to the United States and we had actionable intelligence that they were clearly targeting critical infrastructure uh, in, within, our, within our nation, that the Air Force and other components of the, the military would take them down. And it is clearly the responsibility of the DOD to stop that attack. If there were an attack in cyberspace, an uh, attack on a, a SCADA system, with the clear intention of taking down uh, our uh, sectors of our electric grid. Do you have the authority to stop that attack? And if not, who does? 
We do not have the authority to stop that attack. And on the critical infrastructure, I think uh, that would fall to DHS. Uh, DHS has some of the authority, I think, extending that to critical infrastructure um, is something that the government is addressing in the White House-led legislative proposals to ensure that we encompass that right. General, then um, let me ask you this. How do you think CyberCom should uh, work with other uh, government agencies and the private sector to leverage the powerful capabilities that you possess uh, for the protection uh, of networks and, uh, and infrastructure, uh, not specifically within the dot .mil uh, domain? Um, uh, in particular, well, let me, let me stop there and I will I'll, I'll come back if I need to. Uh, uh, to answer that question, I am going to give you two uh, uh, Congressman, two two pieces of uh, that, break it out into components. First, um, for Cyber Command, technically there's two things that we can do. The Defense Department, the Intel community, Cyber Command, it's we can provide malicious uh, software signatures uh, to uh, help protect that and early warning. So those are the two capabilities. The issue that you raise is so how do we go about doing that? the roles and responsibilities between the Defense Department, DHS, and the Intel community. And I think that is where the partnership that Secretary Gates and Secretary Napolitano addressed in their initial memorandum of agreement in September 2010 is focused on addressing that. We have got to bring those two departments together. I think both secretaries see that. And that intent of that memorandum of agreement is a first step in how we leverage the capabilities that NSA has to help uh, DHS. So I think that is a step in the right direction. General, we know that uh, the, the tutelage program is designed to provide perimeter defense to the dot mill network. What is the best way to extend similar protection to the dot uh, gov network and who does that? How do we do it? I believe the best way is to take that capability and work with industry to do that in a manner uh, similar to what we are trying in the defense industrial base pilot with DHS and the Defense Department. And that pilot, um, the Department of Homeland Security and the Defense Department are working with the Tier 1 Internet service providers to provide that technical capability to them along with some of the signatures and stuff to defend uh, a couple of defense industrial base companies. Uh, about 30 of them, I think, is what it will end up being. And it's showing that you can do that, that it scales across that level, will demonstrate that with a few of the capabilities that we have. I, I think concurrent with that, as we're doing that, uh, we have to look at the authorities and legislation to do the rest, what, what's required and how do we quickly move to do that. Technically, we can do that very quickly. We want to make sure that we then have the authorities to do that as well. And the pilot would show that we can do that. And so that you've touched on perhaps the taking that the next step. How do we then? We also what's the best way to defend uh, the dot com network? And who is it's particularly on critical infrastructure? So much of it is owned and operated in, in private hands. How do we then take that to the the next step? And and who where do those responsibilities and authorities lie? Uh, um, from a technical perspective, the easiest way to do that is to partner with the Tier 1 Internet service providers. Government traffic and critical infrastructure traffic can be segregated in those areas and protected by those companies easiest and our ability to work with them in classified environment to ensure they have the signatures and stuff is probably the technically quickest way to go and the best way to go. It scales and it shows it and that's what the pilot would do. If we can do it for government, the way the government spread out, that would scale also to critical infrastructure if we deem it necessary to do those as well. Very good. Uh, I see my time has expired. I have other questions, but uh, thank you for your answers, and uh, I yield back this time. Thank the gentleman. Dr. Miller, let me just, to, to be clear, ask you, uh, do you agree with Secretary Lynn's comments that the best laid plans for defending military networks will matter little if civilian infrastructure is not secure? Yes, sir, I do. And, and my understanding from the exchange from Mr. Langevin and, and General Alexander is that currently Cyber Command does not have authority to make uh, civilian networks secure? 
That's correct. Cybercom's mission is to is to provide the, uh, the connectivity and oversight of our networks and to protect them, and to be prepared to conduct full spectrum cyberspace <laughs> operations as directed by the President, and Secretary of Defense. Uh, the National Security Agency, as you know, has provided technical assistance to as we've uh, to our interagency partners, and particularly working with the Department of Homeland Security and the Cyber Pilot Program that General Alexander talked about is a great example of that. We think we need to do more of that and, and to move forward as quickly as possible. Well, that gets me to, to the, the next question. In, in the same article, uh, Deputy Secretary Lynn said that the Pentagon was working with Homeland Security and the private sector to look for innovative ways to use the military's cyber defense capabilities to protect the defense industry as a start. Uh, so what are some of those innovative ways? Sir, the principal one that we are focused on now uh, in bringing the innovation and, and new technologies to them is to look at the application of the of the systems that you referred to earlier and that General Alexander spoke about to help on the on perimeter defense. That's working with the ISPs, as General Alexander noted. The other side of it, just like for DOD, we need to think about the cyber hygiene and what we can do internally. We need to think about how to hunt on our own networks and look for the problems that may already exist, and we need to work on that on that perimeter defense. I think all of those apply as well to the .gov, to the, to the rest of the government, and all of them, all those principles apply as well to the critical infrastructure in particular, the 18 designated areas of critical infrastructure. And so the, as we look at what can be done to improve the posture from where we are today, the legislative proposals that the administration is considering could span all of those. What are the incentives and, and assistance that can be provided for cyber hygiene, as well as for the, for example, as well as for the active defense? Yeah. Well, as I say, we're anxiously awaiting those. Last question, General Alexander, um, are you are you uh, convinced that we can you can share some of this sensitive information to help provide perimeter, greater perimeter defense, and protect national security at the same time? Mr. Chairman, I'm convinced that the Internet service providers can protect sensitive information. Okay. Let me yield at this point to uh, Mr. Klein. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, gentlemen, for being here for your testimony. Um, I find myself still scratching my head over the same issues that we've had uh, heard discussed here, um, and that is how do you even make a distinction between an attack? on defense and keep it separate from an attack on something that's directly related to defense, a critical infrastructure uh, question. Uh, clearly, if you shut down the uh, financial system in the United States, it would affect defense, it would affect everything. So uh, I want to make sure I'm clear on two things. One, I understand we're, we're all eagerly anticipating this uh, prospective legislation. Uh, although I must say um, we have way too much experience in this committee with legislation, putting things in law, directing the Department of Defense to do stuff, and then the Department of Defense just deciding not to do it, frankly. Now, we put in law, for example, Mr. Thornberry and I worked very hard a couple of years ago in the NDAA directing the Secretary of Defense and the, and the DNI to come up with a charter for the National Reconnaissance Office. Now, that's a year and a half late now. It's been in law, but we haven't, we haven't seen the results. And I, I know people are working. In fact, we've had interim reports. So while I'm delighted that there is prospective legislation, uh, I'm just suggesting that might not be the whole answer. I, I trust, General and Mr. Secretary, that you're working on, on, how, to, on how to fight this in, in, in any case, despite the legislation. I want to see if I understand this. Uh, I'm looking at the mission of U.S. Cybercom, uh, stated here in front of me, plan, coordinate, and so forth, and it says, and when directed, conduct full-spectrum military cyberspace operations in order to enable actions in all domains, ensure U.S. allied freedom of action in cyberspace, and deny the same to our adversaries. So if directed, then you, you would step in and, and provide defense, uh, active or passive, um, in the event of attack on, on infrastructure. Is that correct or not correct? 
Well, that, that's correct, as you stated. Let me just give you, if I could, uh, Congressman, a couple of points on that. Um, what that really drives to is, uh, as part of my uh, confirmation hearing, uh, Senator Levin asked a very similar question, which was, so what's that, what's that mean? And the specifics of it are, if we were overseas uh, in an area of hostilities, um, Cyber Command would be operating under Title 10 authorities, mm -hmm. and we'd be taking on the adversary, and we'd have the authority to operate in cyberspace in that case. The issue uh, becomes a little bit more difficult when you start looking at cyberspace as a global capability and bouncing through neutral countries. Now, what are the authorities of land warfare? What are the laws and what are the policies on it? You have the inherent right of self-defense, uh, but what can you do to stop somebody in, in a neutral country? Uh, and in cyberspace, it's easy to jump through neutral countries to attack someone. And the third and the most difficult is what happens if they use the United States infrastructure to attack the United States. How do you do that? All of those are, are key things. For us to operate, for us to operate overseas, it's a, it's a execute order uh, from the Secretary of Defense and the President. And that's what that, that specifically lays out. And that execute order gives us the authority to operate under those conditions and defines those conditions for us. What about if it's not overseas, which is kind of an antiquated, bizarre concept when we're talking about cyberspace, but, but what if it's not overseas? Is there a when directed still possible here? That is correct. There is a when directed, and uh, that's, I think, the first And by whom? It would be by the Secretary of Defense and the President. Okay. Uh, let, me, uh, uh, let me just about run out of time, but uh, very quickly, um, we've, there are a number of issues about getting adequately trained personnel um, in high, high technical areas. Uh, it's true in space, uh, and I would think it would be true in cyberspace. And so are, are you having difficulties, or is there anything we could do that, that would help you recruit and retain people who can actually take on this task? Uh, there are some things, Congressman, that I think we will need to work jointly, and that's uh, like we do proficiency pay for linguists and others. What is it that we need in cyber, uh, for our cyber uh, personnel? Um, we are going out to hire. The services are. Uh, right now, that's not an issue, but the services are discussing that type of pay for those to get it. We do want to create a force. I think the other thing that we're looking at is how do we collapse some of our uh, military occupational specialties down into a few that allow us to, to look at the full spectrum, defend, operate all the way through. Uh, I think we need to do that, and the services have been wonderful in, in setting that up. And the way that we would define that is by looking at how we're going to operate in those foreign areas. How do we need our forces to be developed? This is a very technical area. Uh, there is discussion, and we will evolve how this command works, I think, over the next few years. Um, we have had great success on the NSA side of hiring a highly talented workforce and keeping them. Our retention is amongst the best in government. So I think we can do the same in cyberspace. I think we'll get a lot of people that want to take this mission on. Okay, thank you. I trust you'll let us know if you need legislative assistance. I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gibson. Well, thanks, Mr. Chairman. And I thank the uh, distinguished panelists here today. I thank them not only for their testimony, which has uh, been illuminating, but also for their leadership in this key area. Uh, and as we proceed, um, you know, given classification issues, if we start to move in an area, I assume that uh, you'll uh, make it clear to me. But uh, I'm interested in probing a little bit further the issue of unity of effort. Uh, and uh, I have a question both on the governmental side, the whole government side, and then also on the private side. I think I'll start with the private side. It looks, it looks to be simpler. Uh, do we have a list of instructions uh, for individuals what to do uh, if they sense they're under some kind of cyber attack, similar to like SIADA instructions of how to report uh, that we pass out to uh, infrastructure or proliferate in any way? Uh, this is outside the scope of the Department of Defense uh, the responsibilities. What we have is a, the, as a government working together on a national cyber incident response plan, part of that is to, is to clarify what those, what those uh, activities and responses would be. I, I think it's 
fair to say we have some, some more work to do there. We'd be happy to respond for the record with more details. Could I add, uh, Congressman, a couple things on that? And I did throw that over on Dr. Miller uh, because I think the first part is uh, it's really how do we, tain, we train our teams to hunt and operate within our system. So system administrators today need to evolve to people who can police networks tomorrow. And when they do that, part of the training that we give our, our red, our blue, and some of our what we call green teams is just what you're talking about. That has to be a continuous process, not something that happens once every uh, two years. Uh, so how do we evolve that force will be a key part of the defense, and that's part of that active defense that I referred to. Yeah, well, very good. And, and I think you'd appreciate that uh, standardized reporting uh, format would probably be helpful as we go forward. Uh, and then related, now we're in the governmental realm. I'm trying to get a sense of, and I can imagine the challenge that you have, trying to coordinate this effort uh, f uh, towards unity of effort. Uh, so is this event-driven or is it battle-driven? Do you have a, uh, is there a working group that meets across the intelligence communities, the DHS and the DOD? Uh, how do you go about coordinating your effort now, given the challenges that you have? So, so we do have uh, meetings, especially in the area. Let me focus this a little bit more into uh, looking at malicious software, tactics, techniques, and procedures, people that are trying to get into the networks. We do have meetings both within the government that looks at this. So the computer emergency response teams at DHS, within DOD, and across the government work that. Private industry, selected parts of those also participate in that at times because they have some expertise and going back and forth on those is key. Uh, and the reason private industry is brought in is some of the signatures for the antivirus community that private industry creates helps protect government systems, and we want to ensure that that's done right and that they have the full advantage of that. Thanks very much. Uh, Chairman, I yield back. Mr. West. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ranking Member, and uh, sirs, pleasure and honor to see you all here today. Uh, four elements of national power, the dime theory, and of course the I stands for informational, so I think it's very important that we recognize that aspect here on this modern battlefield, and we you know, congratulate you on standing up to CyberCom, but th this is one of my big concerns. You know, what can we do to combat the proliferation of uh, Islamic terrorism propaganda on the Internet? Uh, because I see this as just another weapon on this modern-day battlefield. And if we are serious about this global war on terror, uh, this propaganda is truly a, a tool or weapon that uh, they are levying against us. Now, does that fall under CyberCom's purview? And if not, who is contending or dealing with that? I think that's a policy issue uh, in terms of whether we choose to stem the flow of radical propaganda and how. Technically, Cyber Command could be one of the agencies given that mission to go to. We have not been given that mission um, under either a CT or a Cybercom authority. So I think the, the question is, one, has a decision been made to do just that? And to my knowledge, there is no decision to block the radical propaganda on the networks. Uh, if it was, then it would, could technically go to either Cyber Command or one of the other agencies. So who makes the decision? That would be the White House, the, the Principals Committee? Uh, I think. That would be a, a, a decision at the level of the, of the President and, and the, as, as the General said, of the, of the, of the Cabinet as well. The, there is no question that, that uh, this administration, is, as the past administrations, are working to counter that, the ideology that you spoke about. The Internet has an important role in that in terms of how we get our message out. And obviously it's part of how these groups have used, you know, something that these groups have used as well. But you put your finger on a, uh, on a central policy question that, that, um, that, that remains uh, essentially open. Well, I, but my, my fear is that the longer it remains open, the more we get exploited and the more uh, we get infiltrated across this country. So uh, at one point in time, are we going to tackle this, this the, question? The authorities for dealing with that are not principally Department of Defense authorities. And there's, there's one other thing, Congressman, if I could on this, um, just to add to that. If we see this on U.S. infrastructure and it's wrong, we can reach out uh, through the FBI 
and ask that that be removed. And we have a high success rate in, in getting that done. So when we see things that are particularly wrong, we reach out. And it's all the companies, when they see that, they take it off, both here and global. Okay. And so there is a way of doing that when we see those. So I didn't want you to think what the way I answered it is we're not we're not reaching out and causing it to be removed globally. We can reach out and ask that it be removed globally, and we're having a pretty good success at doing that. And if I could just add very briefly, the, the D in your dime model, sir, uh, the diplomatic, diplomatic effort is Absolutely. also important, and that's something that, that this administration is obviously pursuing. Okay, uh, I, I got it, but, you know, we're getting our butts handed to us on that, that means. And when I think about Major Hassan and the, some of the things that he was able to utilize the Internet for, you know, I don't want to see a repeat of those type of uh, circumstances. So thank you very much, and I yield back. Thank the gentleman, and as I'm sure he knows, there's a number of folks who have served in theater who share his frustration, who uh, think there's a lot more we could be doing but uh, are not doing, and uh, I'm very sympathetic with that uh, view, view as well. Um, General Alexander, let me follow up on uh, what Mr. Klein was asking about on people. Um, and, and I know you said you'd get back to us on uh, additional authorities. And, and you, you said you've got a great record at retaining people at NSA, but those are not necessarily military folks uh, who may go through basic training and, and all the rest. Um, can you get and keep the kind of people you need for cybercom? Uh, um, with the military requirements, or does there have to be some greater flexibility than we're used to? Well, I'm, I'm an optimist, Chairman. I think we can, one, get them. I do think it will, may require more authorities, but we've got to look at that. And more importantly, I, I'd like to put forward this thought. Um, we want NSA to have one certain level, technical level of expertise that Cyber Command can use, and we want Cyber Command to have a breadth and a deployment capability. Um, and so these two have to work together. And I think we can do both. I think we can get the service people on one side that may require some additional authorities. We've got to look at it and come back to you. And I think we want the NSA infrastructure to have this technical depth that we can rely on back and forth. I think that's absolutely vital, sir. I would just briefly add that we owe a report on this issue, the section, I think, 934 of the National Defense Authorization Act. And in addition to the, to the factors that the General talked about, I think we need to look hard at what we can do under existing authorities, including making better use of the Guard and Reserve. Uh, that is a, that's an essential part of, of what we need to do. The type of people that, that we are looking for will span, will, will, will span a wider range than the, than the profile of people that were the, the type of people that we're looking for with the skills for cyber will span a wider range than the standard profile for, for military service. And we need to have a higher degree of flexibility and, and continue to uh, look to uh, target those groups and to, and to, to work in the, some of the pilot programs we have underway now to work with them and to have outreach so that they see what DOD can provide for their education and uh, see what the, the, that they can make a contribution to national security as well. Well, we, we, we want to work with you. I, you made an impression on me in your written statement, General, where you said this was the thing you were most concerned about or, or uh, however you phrased it, but please go ahead. I was going to add that uh, I hate to give the Navy all the credit here with the, him sitting right behind me, but the Navy Postgraduate School has also started a master's degree course in January that will produce a master's with a, um, uh, in cyber, uh, that is a technical degree either in computer science or double E with the majority of the courses being in cyber and cybersecurity related things. So that's a step in the right direction and some of the things that we need to do more of. Okay. Dr. Miller, uh, one hears, and uh, maybe one of you all mentioned it in your uh, written testimony, about the, uh, back to the authorities issues, uh, about the military's ability to provide support to civilian authorities when called upon to do so. How does that fit in a cyber context? Sir, the, the, let, me, let me talk about both sides of that, if I can. The, the first is, as we were discussing earlier, is that the department does recognize that we're dependent on both our partners in, in government, so the .gov, and our partners in industry to be able to conduct just military operations. 
and to succeed in those operations so that we have a stake uh, in addition to the stake we have in the broader security of the nation. We have a stake in just our ability to, to operate itself. Um, the Department of Defense, as you alluded to, has authorities to provide defense support to civilian authorities uh, under existing law. And the challenge associated with that in this area is that it gives a uh, good set of authorities for responding to an incident. And what's not so clear is that it gives the appropriate set of authorities to assist in prevention of attack in the first place. And as we've looked at, looked at, legis at possible legislation, we're looking at what additional authorities may be required for the Department of Homeland Security so that it can provide that degree of protection, and then what a set of authorities may be necessary, if, what changes may be necessary for the Department of Defense to assist in providing that prevention as opposed to uh, solely focusing on response. That's, that's, you've asked exactly the right question. It's, we intend to address it in legislation, and, uh, and we understand that it, we understand that there's the, con, there are legitimate concerns about imposing costs on private industry, and, and we need to think through that. But we also understand that we're, as, as, as we've discussed earlier, that we have a lot of catching up to do. Yeah. Well, and as your answer recognizes, response after the fact to a cyber event is not really a very good uh, answer to uh, the challenges we face there. So let me just ask about a couple more things, and I yield uh, to the ranking member, Mr. Gibson, if they have other questions. Uh, you, you, again, I can't remember exactly which of you talked about this, but there were two um, efforts underway. One is the Enduring Security Framework, and the other is the Defense Industrial Base Pilot. Um, could either or both of you all expand a little on what those are and where we are with them? Um, the Enduring Security Framework is a partnership between government with DHS, DOD, the DNI, and industry to look at critical um, cybersecurity issues throughout uh, the different components from communications devices, computers, and others. Um, I think that is a great partnership between the government and industry in identifying problems and solutions to those problems. If we can identify those problems, it's been our experience that industry, in developing much of that equipment, will go solve those free to the government. That is a huge step forward, and we've made some tremendous uh, jumps in that area. I think industry has more than done their share. It has been a privilege and honor to work in that. That's been great. The Defense Industrial Base pilot uh, takes the uh, technology that we have within the department and uses some of that with some of the Tier 1 Internet service providers to test and ensure that that would work under the concept that I discussed earlier with the inter Tier 1 Internet service providers and ensure that we can do what we are doing now for the Defense Department for uh, these defense industrial base uh, companies. Uh, once we've done that, the key is now identifying the authorities and ensure that we have the authorities to do the rest of it. So we're only going to do a few narrow things under the, uh, the DIB pilot, a few narrow activities. Once we've shown that we can do those, the rest of those activities would be added. We'll have to ensure that we have the legal framework for that, and everybody agrees with that for the rest of those. And that may be parts of the stuff that come forward from the White House on the legislative proposals that we have. Sir, and if, if, sir if, I could, if I could add very briefly, the, the, the Enduring Security Framework, we found that the, the industry that participate help both on the, helping us understand the problem and, on the, and, and working the solution. So, and, and that is, as the General said, is very important. I want to distinguish, uh, as we talk about the DIB pilot, we really have two, there are really two things underway. One is a broad def defense industrial based pilot in which we are sharing information about potential threats and, and looking at how to do that more effectively. It's been a two-way street. It's been very effective, and we're looking to continue that and grow that. It's been focused primarily on the, uh, on the cyber hygiene side, if you will, on, on the uh, defending the networks better. The, the, the new element that the general has been referring to is, uh, is, is been added to that, and we're currently examining how to, how to implement that. That's, we've called that for shorthand the, the opt-in pilot because companies would opt-in to participate on that. And uh, as, as the general said, we're working with a number of, of defense industrial-based companies 
in several internet service providers. That has not yet kicked off. It's something that we, I hope that we're, I hope that we're very close to, to initiating. And by way of, of analog, it's, it's looking to, to, for part of the dot com to bring what Einstein 3 is supposed to bring to that dot gov. Uh, and it's, as General Alexander said, it's not the full suite, but it's, we're looking at a, a way to get started and show that we can, can do this and, and to make it work. And about how long would it take, do you think, to prove that it can work? 90 days. About 90 days we're looking at for the, to, to execute this pilot. Okay, good. Thank you. Mr. Langevin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, General Alexander, uh, Cybercom has um, maybe two maybe primary missions among, among several, but two primary missions. Uh, first, to ensure that military networks stay uh, online uh, and also uh, to support our warfighters uh, in their missions around the world. Um, we've talked uh, before about, uh, about the network defense side of the issue, but I'd like to turn to the, the second side, uh, if I could, of uh, support to the warfighter. Uh, you've rightly recognized that cyberspace, uh, cyberspace is a new domain uh, similar to land, air, sea, and, and space. How do you make sure that uh, cyber is treated equally and not just as a supporting entity? Um, can you outline the, the command structure for integrating uh, non-kinetic uh, cyber effects into both tactical and operational levels of a, of a conflict. Uh, and beyond the use of, uh, of cyber domain, uh, how are cyber mission areas different from the electronic warfare mission areas? Well, let, me, let me start with the first one, and then I'll come back to electronic warfare, if I could. <clears throat> uh, on the first one, our staff is organized like the, co -com, like the rest of the COCOM staffs, the combatant commander staffs with the J3, J5, J2, J6, et cetera. Our planning folks reach out to the combatant commands, and we're working with those combatant commands on their plans to integrate cyber into those plans from both a defense and a full spectrum capability. My experience to date is that the commands have jumped on this. Every one of them has been eager and helpful to do that. I, I am extremely pleased that they're, they're rolling this into the full spectrum. They realize the importance of it both to defending our, our capabilities and extending those out. Um, if you were to make bubbles on the role of cyber and electronic warfare, they're going to touch together. Electronic warfare predominantly being looked at today, if you will, for jamming radars back and forth. I mean, that's the way we look at it in physical space by radio waves. Um, in cyber, we're, we're acting within networks. You can picture a time in the future where those two may come together. And it may be that the department begins to bring some of that together uh, from both a technical perspective and an operational perspective. We're not there today because the way we build our EW capabilities is separate and apart as part of the defensive systems of aircrafts and other things like that. Um, I did go to school in some of that, so I do understand those parts. And I think you can see them coming together as the digital technology matures. Very good. Um, anything else in the area of uh, electronic warfare uh, that you want to get into? Or? Um, not that I can think of, uh, okay. Congressman. Okay. Yes. Um, Dr. Miller, uh, and also to you, General, um, in uh, addition to the $159 million provided in the President's fiscal year 2012 budget to support Cybercom, uh, what other costs are associated with cyber operations across the, depart the Department uh, for fiscal year 2012? Uh, to what extent uh, will DOD's current efficiency and cost saving efforts uh, impact Cybercom's current and future uh, cybersecurity funding, if at all? And to what extent uh, is DOD taking steps to ensure that Cybercom and associated military components are are organizing in a manner that's, that, that prevents or, or minimizes duplication? Uh, sir, let me first say, glad to provide for the record the breakdown of the, of the cost in more detail than I did in my prepared statement. What I could do is say, refer to a, a $3.2 billion dollar total for cybersecurity and the $159 uh, million dollars associated with U.S. Cybercom. The other, the, the largest single category is, is, is uh, information assurance, which includes our, our public, key, public key infrastructure and key management initiative. That's, a, that's at a little over $2 billion for FY12. Rather than go through each of the other categories, I, I, I would uh, uh, just, I guess, add 
we noted the importance of science and technology, and about 258 million of that is, is in the S&T realm. We'll provide the rest of those, uh, if you like, for the, for the record. As we look at the, uh, the work on efficiencies I, uh, and, and the importance of, of both saving money and improving security, uh, I'll turn it over to General Alexander. One of, the, one of the most innovative and interesting ideas and concepts for how to pursue those in, in, in tandem is to look at how we can move to a cloud-based architecture in a way that improves security. If, you, if we do it the wrong way, it could in, in, increase our cybersecurity challenges. If we do it appropriately over time uh, and move to uh, uh, virtualization of, of some of the, uh, in, if you will, interior of the architecture, we'll have the ability to present a much more challenging target to those who want to, who want to attack us. I think General Alexander can speak to much more uh, in much more detail uh, than I can to that to that issue, um, Congressman. Let me answer two parts of that taking off from what Dr. Miller said. First, um, on the IT efficiencies, one of the things that we looked at: what was the best way that we could help secure the Defense Department's networks, given the vast topology of those networks? And it was our opinion that the best way was to go to a thin cloud virtual cloud environment, uh, analogous to the way that Google, AT&T, and others are doing, but do that for the Defense Department. Uh, as we looked at that, we also believe that we can do that more efficiently in terms of manpower and monies. That's yet to be proven, but it does give us a much more defensible way. Uh, so the IT efficiencies is something that Secretary Gates has pushed out that we are looking at how can we now help do that. and what. Our intent is, is if we can do this right, we can now take part of the workforce that we have in IT and train them to be full spectrum cyber capability. That's something that working with the service will help build the capacity quicker that, w that I mentioned is that shortfall. So I, I think that's one of the things that we're looking at. We've discussed it with the service chiefs. That's something that we've got to walk through. The service components are looking at. That's a huge step. Uh, now to get there, um, NSA is actually testing out parts of that right now in our infrastructure, and we'll prove that that's right. The other thing, that duplication of effort, I would just tell you that that's one of the things as a cybercom commander that I take very seriously. How do we ensure that the services are doing this as a joint team versus each one of them doing the same tool four times? Uh, we have got great cooperation with the services in doing that. Our components said we're bringing all that together. Our J3 and J5 will take that on. Our suite of tools will be looked at and scrubbed in that way. And we've already started that with our planning process. Very good. Uh, with that, uh, gentlemen, thank you very much for your, your testimony. I know this is an enormous challenge that we, uh, we all face in, the, uh, in, the, in cyberspace, and I uh, just appreciate your dedication and the, uh, the work you're doing. Thank you. Mr. Gibson. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chairman. And really just a... Uh, a summary of what I'm taking away from the hearing uh, and from also reviewing the uh, written testimonies. I, I think uh, uh, Cyber Command is doing a tremendous job in gaining situation awareness, getting organized, trying to get their arms around uh, the threat and to take concerted action. Uh, but uh, to a degree, our country is, uh, is hampered the, the effort towards unity of effort, uh, that we need mission clarity authorities, legal framework, and organizational design. And what strikes me is that these are similar findings to the QDR independent panel uh, and the need towards uh, looking at both congressional, uh, organizational reform so that we can facilitate better, legislate better, and provide better oversight, and then also executive uh, uh, reform, executive branch reform so that the DOD can get the guidance it needs uh, to move forward. So uh, these are areas of interest uh, to me, Mr. Chairman, and I look forward to, I appreciate you calling this hearing and the testimony from our expert witnesses here, and I look forward to working with you as we go forward. I yield back. I think the gentleman, the areas he identified are also of interest to me, as, as, as he knows, so I, I want to pursue it along with the gentleman. Um, General Alexander, following up on, on your conversation with Mr. Langevin, do you have a th the uh, authority you need as cyber Com commander to eliminate duplication in the services. I believe I have all the authority I need to eliminate duplication with the services 
more importantly, I have their support in doing it. They want to do this. It, it makes sense. Nobody's pushing back. Uh, the key is finding all of that for all of us because there is a lot of ingenuity that goes on. Um, to date, I've not found anyone that's pushed back on that. Uh, I believe that through both the joint staff and the JROC process, we can push that. And through the Deputy Secretary and the policy level, we'll get all the support we need. I don't see any issues with that. Okay. It's more of just making sure that they surface. Uh, I'm, I'm always concerned when something becomes a very, you know, high priority issue, then all sorts of programs get put, have that label put on them to take advantage of the budgetary uh, things that go with it and, and ferreting out what's, what's real and needed uh, versus what may be uh, an effort to gain more of the defense pies is, is uh, an important capability, I think, for you to have. Can you talk... Um, a little more generally, though, about budget. Uh, obviously, we are going to be in a uh, limited budget for the government, for the Defense Department, for some years to come. As we think about cyber and spending money, um, you know, it doesn't cost very much money to send an electron through through a fiberglass uh, pipe. But but where uh, is our money going to have to go? in order to defend the country properly? I mean, I assume people has got to be number one. Uh, but can you elaborate not just on this year's budget, but on those trends over the next several years and what you see the most growth in when it comes to cyber? Well, uh, Chairman, I think you hit it on the head. People is the big thing here in cyber and for our future. Investing in people is key. Um, we are building capacity, and as, as you correctly noted, that is one of the key things that we've got to go build and go work, and the services are helping us do that. In my budget, both the military and the civilian side, that's the biggest portion of the budget, uh, people. Uh, the next is facilities to operate in, the IT infrastructure that we need to operate. That accounts for another 25% uh, of the budget and operations is the, the last part. So if you break it out, people is the, the biggest share of the budget. Uh, one of the things that I, would, that I would just highlight is we did look at building an integrated cyber center that brings together all the different elements that we have within the department, all the different centers within our department, and potentially across the government into one facility that allows us to operate seamlessly from peacetime to crisis and back and forth. I think that's huge. And in this budget here is the planning and development of that facility. Okay. So if I could, if I could add very briefly, for overall IT, the request for FY11 was was 36.6 billion dollars. For 12 was 38.4. We actually hope that that number will come down over time as we as we move to a different architecture and we'll be able to make some savings there. For overall expenditures relating to to cybersecurity, the numbers the, in FY10 the the number was about two point. Nine six billion. Eleven request was three point two, or a little under, and for twelve we're a little over three point two billion. So we've increased somewhat. Particularly, I, th I think we're focusing those resources better as we look to, for example, increase substantially how much we hunt on our own networks and so forth. But we'd be happy to provide the the next level of granularity if you like. I'm afraid that if I if I did it real time, you'd you'd you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the staff could take it, but I'm not sure that uh, <laughs> that I could. But but it is it it is I think helpful for us to see the the longer term trends because I think we're all going to be uh, challenged in, in that regard. Dr. Miller, one thing we really haven't touched on too much today is um, the whole subject of international cooperation in getting any of this done. Mm -hmm. We have talked about how geography doesn't matter very much in, in cyber, but can you just uh, briefly touch on, on the international aspect of this? Sir, sure, I'd be uh, very glad to. That the, uh, as, as I talked about before, working with our international allies and partners is one of the key five initiatives that we have underway as part of our strategy, so we recognize its importance. And we recognize that because we operate and, and fight in a coalition, uh, that, the secure, in, that the security of our information, the security of our operations is also going to be dependent on the security of our, of our partners and allies networks as well. As we have begun uh, really pushing out on cybersecurity efforts uh, internationally, the first focus, that, uh, but, but I should put that differently, uh, a very, a very significant focus has been on working with our, with, with our 
allies, uh, Great Britain, uh, uh, Australia, New Zealand, and Canada. We have longstanding relationships with them and uh, on, on intelligence issues, and that's been a, a good foundation for what we do on cyber as well. Uh, a very significant effort over the last year with NATO and having cybersecurity be one of the key thrusts of the, of the NATO strategic concept that was, that was brought forward at the, at, the Lis uh, at the Lisbon summit, I think is a good accomplishment. Um, the cyber, cyber uh, secu uh, security center that's been established has begun to operate, it, um, and we, need, we have a lot more work to do there in NATO in terms of implementing that, that effort. We have also worked with other partners and allies around the, around the globe, and, uh, uh, including, for example, the Republic of Korea and Japan, and are beginning to, beginning to have, I think, useful conversations there. One of the other areas, sir, that I just want to add is that we need also to have uh, conversations about cyber and other strategic issues with Russia and with China. I think we've made some, some headway with respect to Russia and having the initial conversations on cybersecurity. Uh, our uh, lead on this for the National Security Staff, Howard Schmidt, took a team there just a little over a month ago to, to, to have this, to, to begin this conversation. And so far with, with China, we've not yet really been able to have the same level of conversation. Uh, I think transparency and, and, and understanding about, about how, each, how each of us approaches this, this challenge is very important to avoid any misunderstandings or miscalculations. Um, finally, for me, I think, uh, General Alexander, if, if you had to grade our ability to defend DOD networks, what sort of grade would you give us at this stage, like A through F? I would give us today probably a C going up. Uh, and the reason I say a C is um, we are working extremely hard on building the hardening part of our networks. Uh, we've done an awful lot of work to bring in the host base the security system and made tremendous movements, and we're moving in that range and building that up and training the force and hardening that and have made tremendous progress over the last two years. Uh, when you looked at how uh, the problems we had on our networks a few years ago to where we are today, it's a huge improvement. Uh, I'd like to say an A, but I think it's going to take us some time to get to an A, and an A is where I believe nobody could penetrate that network. Uh, but we have made it extremely difficult for adversaries to get in, and every day we improve that. And that has the visibility and support of the Joint Staff and the Secretary. They personally get involved. I had to take the reports up to both of them. And they're looking at that across all of the services, and each of the services are working it hard. We do that by network, by service, by COCOM, by agency. And we're looking at it in a very detailed way on our network operations and network security. But I would say a C today uh, and going up. Well, and, and the going up was really my follow-up question. In, in earlier hearings, we have heard testimony that uh, the advantage is with the attacker, and not only that, but the gap is growing, so that there, the attacker has more advantage if you look at the Internet as a whole and versus the attempts to defend. Uh, but I take it from what you've said that uh, that gap, when it comes to defending military networks, is closing. Uh, that, that our ability to defend is, 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 well, as I say, the gap is closing versus the attackers. Is that right? That's correct, Chairman. Uh, a significant difference from what we've heard from, from the, the, re the civilian infrastructure, I'd say. I um, understand Mr. Johnson has a question. Uh, yes, I do. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this very important um, hearing. And we certainly uh, need to uh, be attuned to the fact that for us to um, uh, get on the dean's list, uh, General Alexander, we're going to have to spend a uh, lot more money than we are spending, and we will have to spend in accordance with long-term um, uh, budgets as opposed to short-term um, uh, continuing resolutions, and uh, 
Uh, it's the uh, welfare of the people that's at stake. Uh, Dr. Miller, you're no doubt familiar with the firm Palantir Technologies, are you not? I'm, I'm not deeply familiar. I know the name, sir. And uh, what about Barrico Technologies? Also know the name. All right. General Alexander, have you worked with Palantir in any of your official capacities? Um, I've, I'm familiar with it. Uh, we've seen some of their technology, and they've demonstrated that. I'm not sure of the number of contracts that we have with Palantir, to be honest. What about Barrico? The uh, same. I know the name. I'd have to go back and look and see exactly what the contracts are with Barrico. Um, General, can you uh, explain what services and capabilities uh, those two firms offer to the uh, Department of Defense and the intelligence community? Well, my, my recollection of, of Palantir was a way of visualizing what's going on in the networks. One of the problems that we have is how do you see what's going on in cyberspace? How do you actually see a network in a way that's meaningful to help defend and operate that? Especially if you have a network that has 15,000 different enclaves and all these different pieces, how do you make that meaningful? And my recollection with working with Palantir um, was here is an idea that we could use for how to look at networks and how to secure it. We are looking at multiple options for how you actually see that. That's one of the things I think I put in my statement, you know, situational awareness. How do you actually see? I think that's an important step for us to all have a common situational awareness. Are those um, tools that are developed for use by uh, the defense and intelligence uh, communities by those uh, um, contractors? Um, are, are, do those contractors have the uh, ability to use those tools or the authority, actually, to use those tools uh, in the private sector? Can they market those tools, in other words, to the uh, private sector? I think every contract is written differently that gives you authorities to do things, and I'd have to go look at how those contracts were written. I'm not personally familiar with the contract, so I'd have to go look at that. Um, and I don't know who those contracts are with specifically, so I'd have to check that out. But generally speaking, in the development of a tool or a capability, in the contract it specifies whether that can be used broadly or whether it can be used only for the government. And it depends on where it's being developed, for whom, and how. Dr. Miller, anything you want to add on that? Sir, General Alexander has it exactly right. And I can't provide any more details. We'd have to go back and look at the individual contracts to answer those questions. Dr. Um, Miller, would you uh, be so kind as to provide my office with uh, uh, the DOD contracts with Palantir Technologies, Barrico Technology, and uh, the firm H.B. Gary Federal um, as soon as possible. Sir, I will, I will uh, do everything possible to do so. What, I need, what I'll need to do is, frankly, um, talk to our general counsel and make sure that the provision of that type of information is allowed uh, contractually. Uh, and, and in any case, we'll get well, back to you as quickly as possible. Information, with as much information as a possible. Contract could could bar the uh, executive uh, branch from um, providing uh, information to the legislative branch. No, no, sir. The the the. I guess the the I would like to. Be able to provide that information to you, and without you know, without knowing all the organizations within the department that have the contracts, I'm going to have to go back and it, it'll take a bit of time to to be able to map that out. And um, uh, I also need to, I need to have a, an assessment of whether uh, or not not of whether or not to provide the information to, to not, me. not of whether or not to provide the information, but in what form to provide the information to you. If you if 
if, well, Dr. Or if you're asking for the if you're asking for just the, uh, the stack of contracts, I will I, I will say I'll take that take that back to the department and be. Yeah, Dr. Miller, if, if you would uh, if you would take the request back, uh, get the lawyers to look at it, uh, see what is possible. If there if it's not possible to provide the information the gentleman's asked, if you if you'd uh, ask the appropriate folks at the department to let us know why. And uh, also, any information provided, of course, you'd, uh, we'd ask that it be provided to the whole subcommittee so that all members uh, can, can have it. So does that yes. sound good? Thank you, Mr. Great. Chairman. And that will uh, conclude my questions. I, I thank the gentleman. And I thank the witnesses very much for being here to testify, for your patience with our delays and other problems, which were rapidly solved. Um, Yep. Mr. Chairman, if I might, I, I, in response to an earlier question I, I, about the, what the government is doing with respect to radical groups' propaganda, I said it was an open policy issue. If I could have a, just a moment, I'd like to clarify. Sure. What I should have said is, is, is that it's a recurring, ongoing policy issue, that these issues need to be dealt with on a case-by-case -case basis, that, as the Congressman said, it's all the tools of, of available to us, including diplomatic tools. And that that we that on a case by case basis there will be a, a question about the our desire to promote free speech and our and our real not just desire but requirement to protect our forces and our people, and 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 so I just wanted if you would, it's not a question of whether the issue is addressed it's a question of how in each case, and one would have to get down to the eaches to 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 respond effectively. I appreciate the opportunity to clarify that, sir. No, I, pr I appreciate you bringing that. And I will also talk to Mr. West about my smith munt Repeal Act. It may be of interest to him as we pursue those issues. Uh, so again, we, we thank you all very much for being here, for the work you are doing in this area. And we anxiously await the administration proposals so that we can all get to work on specific things. With that, the hearing is adjourned.